I need like a little mirror. Are you sure my hair looks fine? Yeah, I love your hair. Your hair is the best part. I try to present like, you know, in past is not homeless, you know, because being homeless, you treat a lot differently, you yeah. know. I guess it's easier when you look like you're... Yeah, like I'm having a good day today because I had a come up, you know, I had uh, somebody, a sugar daddy basically give me 40 bucks. So I was able to get like everything I needed. I got my at MacArthur Park down in Al Alvarado. I got my $3 pack of cigarettes, uh, view Xanax bars, um, half a gram of Fetty. Um, and the guy who gave me the money also gave me crystal. So I bought a pipe. So, so, I'm, say, time so I'm saying good right now, but you know, talk to me again in like eight hours and I'll be, you know, different story. I'll, I'll look like a different person, you know, right. unless I leave right now and hustle. The fact that I'm getting a hundred dollars from this, I'm going to have a good next three days. <laughs> Where are you from, Kenneth? I'm from Elkhart, Indiana. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Northern Indiana? Yeah. By South Bend. Yep. Tell yeah. me about your uh, family growing up. Um, honestly, there's been really, really nothing interesting about that <laughs> or any of them. <laughs> um, I lived in a trailer park until we moved to like this tiny little house in Elkhart um, when I was in the third grade. My parents separated uh, when I was like 20. Uh, it was good. What was your childhood like? How would you describe it? Um, I was a sad kid. I, I, I felt you know, different. I knew I was different. I knew I was gay, you know, and I was confused when people, how people would respond to me when I was just being myself. So I had to like learn to, you know, pretty much create another personality and persona to... To present like you were straight? Yeah. And I have to, and I, you know, in certain areas, I have to do that here. Like that's why I brought like the Lakers so I can think like I will, I'll put my hair away. I wore like a normal pair of sunglasses, not something like this, like bougie. Um, I won't be showing like the gold chain and you know, because why like, you'll get roughed up a little bit. I've been, I've been robbed and assaulted so many times that yeah, I try, I try, I, I try to blend in, but I, unfortunately, especially when I was in the Indiana, I stand out. <laughs> I stand out just a little bit and I'm a target and I put myself in these situations and places to be a target. Yeah. Drugs became a part of your life when? It's funny. I never even drank alcohol until I graduated high school. When I was 17, I started with pot. Um, and once I smoked, I couldn't stop. <laughs> it became like, there's like a physical allergy. You know, where I, I literally just like, and I didn't think anything was off about it. I thought that's how everybody was, you know, once you, once you start it, you just continue to do it all day, <laughs> you know, and then your life revolves around it. Um, and my parents tried to get through my head, like, everyone's not an addict, Ken. You need to start hanging out with normal people, but like, what's normal? <laughs> but I do think there's something different, like... I've done the AA 12 steps. I've relapsed several times, but the addiction is so misunderstood by our society. Um, they don't get the concept of the physical allergy and the mental obsession. Um, if I had a choice, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the things that I do to have to get drugs. I don't want to go do fentanyl, but I have to, or, or I'll be sick, you know. How did you first get fentanyl in your system? Um, you were doing something else? After I left Las Vegas, uh, when I was 20, I only lived there for like three months, and then this, uh, these sh clients that I had, uh, a couple from New York wanted me to move in with them, and I said, no, but can you fly me home? So they, <laughs> they flew me back to Indiana, um, and probably saved my life. But then I started using then. It was a geographic. I started using heroin. <laughs> I was like, okay, this meth is not working anymore. So I'll try heroin. And then when I was out here uh, in California, about when I was 23, probably like three years ago, fentanyl was really starting to come up. 
Um, I had a friend tell me that you can get it on Craigslist. All you have to do is type in white china plates. <laughs> you type in white china plates and it, you, you find people who will deliver it to you. Yeah. I've had fentanyl yeah. delivered to yeah. rehabs for me. Type in what? White china plates. So there's words and there's like code words for the drugs. But this was years ago. I'm pretty sure like it's shut down now. Like, it, you sure know, it's, it's changed or whatever. Yeah, I don't think I'm pretty oh, sure. How old that, you uh, I'm 27. 27. Yeah, 1996. You've been in LA for how long? Um, coming up on two years. And you've been homeless the whole time? No. Uh, basically, since I moved to California, October 12th, 2019, I've been living in rehab facilities. I've been in and out of rehabs. Was there a time when you were doing well? You had money and... Oh, yeah. Just recently. I was a house manager for a rehab. No, but, for what, but for it, before the drugs kind of took hold. I was a great student. I had a full ride scholarship to IUPUI in, in Indianapolis. I was supposed to uh, be in the field of working with people with special needs, like cognitive uh, the, and the developmental disabilities. But I, I, I lost everything when, because of the drugs, you know? The drugs got you into the prostitution drugs. or the prostitution got you into drugs so i wasn't doing hard drugs before i became a prostitute <laughs> like i couldn't control the adderall and alcohol in college i had like a manic ep episode and i'm not diagnosed with anything so i'm not gonna self-diagnose but it was like a bipolar manic episode where i l randomly left now and i was like i'm going to the west coast fuck this life i, I, was, I was stressed out was, you know couldn't show up to fucking class. Uh, I couldn't, I, I just owed people money. I was like overwhelmed, mental breakdown. My car breaks down in North Las Vegas. What do I do? <laughs> I have like $800, you know, that I had stolen from my roommates that I've yet to pay back. I've been in contact, I've, I've worked the steps and I, I made amends. But like when I was just recently doing the steps, um, when I was at a medical detox uh, and rehab, I see, just earlier this year, I was impatient for 124 days. <laughs> um, I got through, through all the steps, but I didn't do step 12. I didn't sponsor anybody. I showed up to a conference for the Fellowship of the Spirit, fucking high on DMZ. <laughs> I, I relapsed some fucking uh, shrooms and DMT, and then I decided I'll go do crack. <laughs> I got drunk before, so I don't even remember how it felt. I've, I've done crack like three times since then, but it's, uh, it's not for me. I'm, I'm, I'm a tweaker and a junkie, unfortunately, and a smoker. Tweaker meaning crystal meth and junkie mm -hmm. meaning heroin or mm -hmm. fentanyl. Fentanyl. Yeah, heroin wouldn't, wouldn't do shit for me with my tolerance. I needed at least to not be sick and just feel, I could feel, I could get by with a dub, so $20. But like, I just bought half for 30, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be hot, <laughs> you know? And then I've been doing it in, on the street since September every day. I've had, two overdoses that happened in September, but I have not overdosed since. I heard you run into Rebecca sometimes in West Hollywood? Yeah, I know Rebecca. Shit, she's crazy. Yeah, Rebecca's <laughs> not doing well lately. Yeah, she, she, she was interesting. I was like, I know you, I've seen you Super online. bright, super talented and bright, but yeah. super self-destructive at the same time. Oh yeah, I relate. <laughs> You know, that's what I've always been told. Like, Ken, why are you doing this? You have so much potential, you know? <laughs> yeah, but the, like, the, the self-destructive people streaks think, are, are... Well, people don't understand addiction. They think that I'm choosing to have this lifestyle, but like, I literally, unless something happens and it, it has to be like a God moment where like, some opportunity I get to lifetime. stop like something like I'm gonna end up in jail which if I did I'm up in Los Angeles County jail I'll, I would I'll be I'll get raped I'll be beaten you know 
I've been caught like I to get by a boost. I like go to stores, I steal shit, and I sell it at Alvar on Alvarado. I'm not proud of that, you know. I go to big corporations. Like I'm not gonna name them, obviously, but I feel like I have no other choice. You know, I want to get a normal job, but I can't function. Like it took me a week and a half to even get here. <laughs> you know, I tried. To get, I've been trying to get here, but like you know, I'm I'm so caught up in my addiction. Where do you sleep at night, or do you sleep? Well, just recently. I got lucky. I got a knee infection, um, so I went to see a cyanide, and the social worker um, put me into. Um, I'm not going to say the name of the facility, but it's a short-term stay. So I have indoor living right now, and I'm trying. I'm trying to get into the tiny homes uh, with Hope of the Valley, um, through the Access Center. I've done their intake. I was on the waiting list, and then I had my phone stolen. No, but you're intelligent. You're college educated. You would think you could. Take get a out. job and, yeah. and support I just you. recently worked, like, I haven't worked now since, it's been a year now, because we're in February. Like, I, like February 1st is when I was kicked out of being a house manager um, and a server for St. Felix and host. And then I was on the street, and then, I, you know, I ran off when I was using. And then I went to, you know, did the 124-day stay. Um, I did a private insurance um, detox for three weeks, and then I did a 90-day with Medi-Cal. So my parents didn't have to pay the $700 for COBRA insurance, because once you turn 25, you don't get that PPO. <laughs> Unless you get your own job and pay for insurance, I'm no longer on my dad's insurance. So I can't just, in a moment, at a moment's notice, call and have them uh, send me an Uber, you know, to go. That's not how Medi-Cal works. The private insurance industry uh, for rehabs is, is different. They will, on the spot, send you an Uber and you could go right now. With Medi-Cal, you have to wait. You have to call every day. <laughs> you get put on a wait list. It's like, but like, I could die at any moment, you know? And I, I'm like, I've always thought I would not make it to 30. Have you OD'd? I have OD'd twice. I've OD'd upstairs um, at MacArthur Park in the uh, train station upstairs. The cops said no one noticed. They just got Narcan and then, you know, because there's, there's other people sitting and smoking. I got up, smoked a little crystal. I had a big headache. <laughs> and then an hour went by and I, I was using fentanyl again. Is this your lowest point right now in your life? No. Because I'm not, I'm not on the streets. You're on the streets, right? I'm off the streets. Yeah. Yeah. If you can blurt, 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 blurt this part out, I'm, I'm at the National Health Foundation. Yeah, I stay at one of their facilities, and I have a caseworker who's trying, trying to get me in. But I have a bed to go to. No, but, but if it weren't for the drugs, you could get your life together easily. Oh my God, yeah. I would have a master's degree. I'd be a, teach, a special education teacher, and I know that. The you drug, know? drugs have unraveled everything. Yeah, like I know, I know my, I know my purpose, but because of addiction, I, I can't fulfill it. Because I, I, I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain. Like unless you, there's like a, a lyric in the song by Cliche Drug Addiction. Unless you've never uh, lived through it, don't fucking talk about it. <laughs> Sorry. It's so misunderstood. When I like, I walk out of fucking pavilions with a fucking uh, Nyquil, Dayquil, you know, two packs to get five dollars, and I'm like crying because it's not, it's not how I want to live. But I don't want to be sick, you know. Are there other addicts in your family? Yeah, I found out that my dad did, did uh, when I was like two years old, there was a, a year where my dad was using crack. Um, he quit and he didn't tell me that until I was like 22. He didn't open up to me. And then when he told me, I was like, why did you never tell me this? You've seen me like struggling now for like, you know, years. Like, 
if you could have helped, <laughs> you know? But he's changed so much, and I love my family so much, but. No. There's hope for you. Un poquito. Fentanyl's not cracked, though. Fentanyl's tough. Xanax, <laughs> too. I can't get high in fentanyl anymore. I, you know, I have to get out of bed, so. Unfortunately, like that's the progression. So that's why I use crystal. <laughs> and it's, it's fucking, it's such a chore, you know, trying to keep up with it. It's, it's, it's a waste of time. I feel like I'm a waste of a vessel, you know. I could be doing so much more, but I don't, I don't know why. Like, I, Emotionally, what do you go through? So I really, I really need this right now because I haven't, I haven't cried in a long time, and this energy gets stored, and you know, and then it needs to be released. I carry so much shame, shame and guilt. So all the things I've, I've done to people, the selfishness, the self-centeredness, the, the, the disease. And it is a disease. <laughs> and then you end up doing things that cause a lot of shame, and then the shame makes you depressed and makes you want to use. I'm to the almost to the point where I want to kill myself. I'm sorry? I'm almost to the point where I want to kill myself. Like, I want to die, but I'm not going to... I'm not, I can't, I can't overdose. Like, I haven't overdosed since, since September, you know? You shouldn't do that. I mean, there, there are people who have gotten clean from fentanyl. I know. You've gotten clean from all these drugs. I have my, my old sponsor, he, he never used meth and heroin because he got sober before fentanyl. He's been sober now for six, seven years. He's an amazing person, but I owe him, I owe him $200. <laughs> you know? I'm a piece of shit. I didn't pay him back. I think fentanyl's like a whole new game for everybody. It's tough. Whoever created it. It's a double. I can't even explain like the pain of coming down from fentanyl and and benzos, and like even if you don't buy Xanax, some some of the people who are making it are putting it in there. Yeah, you know, it's pretty much. Like, I've, I've gone to detoxes and I pop for fucking benzos, but I I did fentanyl. It was laced with benzos. Well, you were probably never intending on being an opiate addict, right? No. You just want to use crystal meth, but you probably got some. Yeah, I remember those ads they on TV, like the Faces of Meth ad, uh, campaign. This isn't that, you know? That's not true. Give you never time. know. Give it time, though. Huh? huh? Give it time. Yeah, oh, yeah. Give me 20 years and I might, I'll might i be busted. You, no, know? you have beautiful teeth right now, but... Right now, but I just saw a dentist uh, three days ago, last week, and I had a second follow-up appointment on, Tuesday, on Thursday, and I didn't make it. <laughs> and I just traded my vape for a fucking phone um, down in uh, the train station at MacArthur Park, and um, he got my ass because it's in Spanish. <laughs> And I don't know how to re like factory re reset. I don't know how to speak Spanish. Like I don't know how to change it to English. Like maybe I'll just go to the one of the tents and ask if they can figure it out, or like one of the people that I trust down there. But I fucking hate going to MacArthur Park. I get my shit and I go. And if I don't, if and if it's midnight and the train shut down, and I stay there, bad things happen. You know. They like in February they found nine bodies in the in the pond, <laughs> just in that one month. Is that right? Yeah, because I don't really want to talk about like the gang related stuff. I'm not in the gang. I'm not affiliated. I just I didn't know anything about about it. You know, I didn't know that like if I went to this person to buy fentanyl, that you know the other person finds out that I'm not buying from him and no longer buying from him and buying from somebody who is a part of another gang so that they start selling me fake shit you know i've been robbed because i was trying you know i got i thought i got permission from like an old timer uh, uh, in a, um, 
don't know if you've ever heard of the gang, um, it's the Gay Boy Gangsters. <laughs> um, I've heard about it. Yeah, but I ran into somebody who was a part of the West. Uh, they're speaking Spanish, and I knew that he was about to rob me. So I rode my bike down the street, and somehow he ends up on an electric scooter and catches up to me on the corner of Alvarado and Six. And he's mad, and he threatens to stab me, and I just gave him everything, except for he didn't want the bike. Um, but it put me into a psychosis where, like, I... You know, I just walked for hours. Like, I had just picked up a dub from this old timer gay boy gangster. Um, I don't do a lot of crystal. I'm super sensitive to it. Like, you know, I do it to get up and get going and figure out how I'm going to get more fentanyl, you know? <laughs> I get it so I can get out of bed. Um, so I wanted to sell it. So that I, If you could live your life over again, what would you have done differently? If I could live my life over again, what would I have done differently? I would have never drank alcohol. I just, I can't take the first one, you know? I would have just never done a drug. Because if I did alcohol, I would just be an alcoholic, you know? I would have never, you know, I didn't choose to have that manic episode where I moved to Las Vegas. That was random and weird, you know? My car broke down and I, I ran out of money. So to survive, what it, like I did what I had to do and I sold my body. I asked it on the strip. That was where it started? That's where it started. It was hard living there because everybody's a tourist and travels and the locals are nasty people. I never went to the underground tunnels, but I've heard about them. Um, the locals I knew and that were doing what I was doing introduced me to meth and they look they look like me they didn't look like the faces of meth campaign you know <laughs> they made it look glamorous and it has such a stigma you know but meth is nasty but like cocaine you know people are like bumping in a club and like and they're like you know Versace shoes red bottoms or whatever and it's cool but like Addiction is so misunderstood, you know? What do you think the biggest misunderstanding is? That it's a choice that we're choosing. Just like being gay. I didn't choose to be gay. It's kind of, I, I wish I would, like, I'm actually, fuck that. I love being gay. You know, I love going to WeHo and I'm proud to be gay. I'm, I'm proud that I got, I, I've been able to live a life where I've gotten out of Indiana because my sister's like, the, They've never even been to a state bordering, like they've been, only been to the bordering states of Indiana. You know, I've got to, you know, do some cool shit um, and be a part of a community that is happy and fun. But some people, you know, still don't like it. <laughs> like literally yesterday I was sitting on a park bench and the guy told me to stop talking uh, like he started to mimic how I speak. And he's like, can you stop doing that? And then my friend was like, yo, that's just Kenneth. That's like, and I was like, I, I can't change my accent, you know? To have to like think about how you're talking and how you, your mannerisms and how you move, that takes a lot of energy, you know? But like people be hating on me because like I could, I'm pa like I pass as not homeless and like I have, you know, nice things sometimes. Um, but I gotta be careful, you know? Because people have come up to me in the subway stations on Hollywood and Western, and he was like, this random guy, no idea who he is. He goes, are you Kenneth? I should've said fucking no. <gasps> well, I didn't do anything, so I said, yeah. And he punches me in the face, and he grabs my backpack, and he runs, and he goes, and he grabs the, I just got in the sleeping bag, I was on the street. They were handing them out for Christmas at MacArthur Park. And he takes it and he just throws it out onto the rail. But then he takes my backpack, walks upstairs and leaves. What did I do? You know, it was targeted. I was targeted, but why? You know, I try to have morals, you know. I don't want to steal from people. 
I'm to the point where I can't even steal from like corporations. I'm getting. I'm gonna get. I'm probably gonna just go back into sex work. How long did you do that? I did it for like a year. And when I stopped, I couldn't have normal sex for like a year. It fucked me up. Because like you're being like bought as an item, you know, and I'm not, I'm a person. <laughs> um, it's so, it's so demeaning, you know, I'm, I'm spiritual, like, this is my temple. And I don't know people know that I've been raped in my sleep, you know. I'll get G'd out from GHB. Just last night, I was falling asleep in the guy's apartment and I went in to go to sleep and he he was he, he just I don't actually want to talk about him in this interview because I, I love him um but it was it was you know people do think and I'm not mad at him because he was under substance he is his behaviors were a result of the control that the substance has on him the grip of the substance you know? And then he wakes up and he doesn't remember any of it, of course. And I knew he wouldn't. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I put your shit in the laundry because you sat on the pizza. <laughs> you know? The cops were coming because he wouldn't stop stomping. So I hit all, you know, the illegal shit. I said, I put it, I put it in your top drawer. And then he wakes up and he, and he can't find anything. And he, like, you know, we do things, um, especially with downers. Like, you'll, and if you aren't staying hydrated and eating, you'll, you'll black out and, like, literally do things. So, like, I don't know. Maybe I was targeted that day because I did something in a blackout. Um, there's been two times, no, two or three times where I woke up in Santa Monica and I didn't have pants on. And I couldn't remember anything. And that last time, uh, it was so bad that it made me leave. I no longer wanted to be homeless there. Because uh, my genitals hurt. I woke up and everything was stolen. I had no pants on. And my genitals were hurt. Really hurt. So I don't, I don't know what happened, but you could, you know, put the pieces together. What's your biggest fear? I'm scared of everything. <laughs> That's a hard question because I'm scared of everything. Being murdered. Because I'm not gonna die. People, I, I, unfortunately, like I've met and I've been involved with nasty people, but I do fentanyl and Xanax, and I have a tolerance, so you, they, you can't kill me, unfortunately, with fentanyl. So like, if somebody wants to to kill me, they're it's gonna have to be violent. I'm gonna have to get shot <laughs> or drown, you know? Because drugs aren't gonna do it. But I think, I think there's hope. I think God does have a plan for me. I think there's a reason why I'm not dead yet. So last, like, in a year, like, nine months, three of, like, my friends, like, two of which I lived with, died. Who died. Because of that, no. I feel like it's, our lives are so, so valuable. You know, I could contribute so much. I was recently sober living in Pasadena in the summer. And right before I relapsed, I had two interviews set up to uh, be a teacher's aide for special needs kids, you know. Why would you relapse when you're finally getting your, your life together? Why did I relapse? Yeah. Um, I don't know. My roommate, uh, a bunch of people in the house had relapsed and left, and I was alone in my room. I got obsessed with like halluc hallucinogenics and the fact that I've never tried them. I, I thought that maybe if I went out and did, you know, GMT, that it could be an alternative. Um, what, what do they call it? Like with marijuana harm reduction? Um, but that shit's so expensive and the government puts such, like the laws, like 
to, like, you know, it's just like, it's so hard to get it. And that's why it's $150 a fucking gram, you know? But I could walk and get a fucking Fetty for five bucks. So what is my broke bitch ass gonna do? You know, I'm not gonna do the spiritual jug. I'm not gonna go meet God, you know? There's another lyric in that song for the meth pipe. It's a glass rose, devil has me in his last lasso into the gates of hell, something, something. But like, I don't believe in the devil, <laughs> but I do believe in energies and in karma. Generational karma, you know. I think we live multiple lives. I think I'm, I'm supposed to fulfill my purpose and then if I don't, if I die because of this lifestyle, I, I think our spirit gets another chance. But we don't get to move up or ascend until we fulfill that purpose, you know? That's what I believe. I know exactly what I need to do, you know? I need to go to rehab. I need to work the steps and I need to sponsor people. I need to, you know? But I need to get fucking sober. <laughs> and it's not that easy as you think, you know? I can't, you can't just be like, okay, I'll go. No, God's gonna choose when it's time for me to go. My experiences are happening so that I can share them with people in the future um, they say that connection is the opposite of addiction. There's a reason why, you know, all these things have happened to me. Because there's another little gay boy out there that hopefully one day I'll be able to sponsor. And, you know, he'll, he'll be able to open up and relate to me. And maybe meet God, you know. But it's a lot of work. This, the, when I did the eight step making, making the list, um, I did that index cards and I had like 140 of them. <laughs> I did 40 or 50, but it wasn't enough to have the psychic change, you know. What would you say is the most important thing you've learned in all of this? The most important thing that I've learned? Put, put others first. Don't be selfish. Self-centeredness, so, like they say, it's the root of all evil. And with drugs, I become so self-consumed. I think I'm a fucking model, you know? Like someone on walking down Sunset Boulevard and some random guy, uh, he hands me his card and asks ask me to come in for, or to call him uh, after the weekend on Monday. Um, he asked me if I was in the industry. Um, and I couldn't even do that. I didn't have a phone. I can make money modeling, you know? But I'm starting to fall apart. <laughs> I'm not going to be like, pretty forever, <laughs> you know? All right, Kenneth. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you for having me. I hope you hope you find a a rehab or a program that that can help you stay on track. Me too. Yeah. If you're young. You can do it. Yeah. I just hope whoever sees this, because I believe in the power of prayer, prays for me. I got a feeling you're gonna figure something out. It has to happen soon because I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> So please, please pray for me. <laughs>